Let's turn your Bibles this morning to Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6. We'll be covering verses uh, 14 through 29. That's not a misprint in your uh, bulletin. That's real. So we'll cover 15 verses this morning. It's in the gospel this morning that Mark takes a bit of a break from his um, documentation of Jesus' ministry to encapsulate for us the, the death of one of the great saints, John the Baptist. Really, the church, for over some 2,000-year history, has known its fair share of hardship and suffering. From our Lord's own persecution and torture and crucifixion at the hands of God's people to the death of his apostles, in every age since that time, those who seek to live a godly life and who seek to live in obedience to our Lord will live a persecuted life. Tragically, throughout the Old Testament, we see that it was God's own people, the Jews, who were those who were the first to pick up the stones to kill God's messengers. And if history has demonstrated anything as it relates to the church, it is that in every age there have existed enemies of God's people. Those who in places of power, who in places of prominence, that use their God-given position not to carry out their God-ordained responsibility to punish evil and to reward good, but rather those who abuse their high position, utilizing their place of authority to persecute God's people instead of using that authority to recognize and promote the merits of Christ's church. This morning we meet such a man, King Herod. King Herod, or excuse me, Herod the Great was the king of Palestine put in place by the Romans. He reigned from 39 B.C. until 4 B.C. He was the one who died within two years of Jesus' birth. But when he died, Rome took his kingdom, that great kingdom, and then divided it into four separate parts giving each part to one of his four sons. One of those four sons is who we meet in our text this morning. It's a man by the name of Herod Antipas. He was placed over rule there of Galilee and Perea. And so throughout the rest of the life of Christ, after the Magi, throughout the rest of the life of Christ, when you you read the name Herod in the Gospels, it's referring to this man, his son, His Roman official title was a tetriarch, but he is properly referred to or commonly referred to in the Gospels as King Herod. It's in in Mark's Gospel that we discover in somewhat of a look into this man's life and thinking what has been true of those who have sought to live a godly life. It's that in the execution of John the Baptist by Herod that we see this morning that the faithful of God have and will suffer persecution at the hands of godless men. It's no coincidence that the account of Herod and John the Baptist's death at the hands of Herod follows Jesus' commissioning of his disciples. He had trained them for ministry He had commissioned them to ministry, and it is in this account that Jesus wants them to understand the persecution they will face in their ministry. Mark begins here in verse 14 of chapter 6 with Herod's fickle fascination with Jesus. His fickle fascination. Look at it in verse 14. It says, And King Herod heard of it, for his name, meaning Jesus, had become well known, and people were saying, John the Baptist has risen from the dead, and that is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. But others were saying he is Elijah, and others were saying he is a prophet like one of the prophets of old. It's here that we see this fascination yet fickle nature of Herod towards Jesus, and we see it, first of all, with Jesus' growing popularity. Mark informs us here from his gospel that Jesus' ministry had not gone unnoticed by Herod. 
That it was through the commissioning of the twelve that that as they began to preach the message of Christ's kingdom, as they began to perform the miraculous sign gifts to validate their message, and as they went from town to town pronouncing both blessing and judgment in Jesus' name, that Herod for sure took a special interest in this man from Nazareth. And as any overly paranoid and power-hungry ruler is, upon hearing of Jesus' claims to be the Son of God, and then hearing of the eyewitness accounts of the miraculous works that he had done, Herod's ears would have been perked up, and he would have had a desire to know about this man from Nazareth. He needed to know if there was really any true threat to his rule from this man. But it was this intrigue about Jesus that brought a fascination as to who Jesus truly was. We see that secondly with his fascination with his possible identity. Look in the rest of verse 14. People were saying, John the Baptist has risen from the dead. And that is why these miraculous powers are at work with him. But others were saying, what? He is Elijah. And others were saying, what? He is a prophet like one of the prophets of old. It's out of Jesus' ministry that the the people begin to formulate in their mind and to postulate who they believe Jesus to be. First of all, they think he's who? John the Baptist. It's Jesus' message of repentance and his disciples' message of the same that were indicative of John's ministry. As you recall from our time in Mark chapter 1, we learn that John was the forerunner to Christ. He was the one that the Lord would send ahead of his Messiah to prepare the hearts of the people. The preparation that John called for was not an external one. It was not of one of moral reform, but rather it was a call of an inward change, a radical change of the heart, so radical that it called for the very end of man in his sin. It was a call for repentance, a radical turn to sin to prepare the way. It was John's call of repentance that served, as it were, to to make a highway to the soul for God's salvation. This radical nature said that every road must be made straight, every rough road made smooth, and every uneven road made level. So the people were prepared and that God could drive his salvation to the human heart. Jesus' message And his disciples' messages encapsulated the same message of repentance. Last week we saw this affirmed in Jesus' commissioning of the twelve, that just as he had come into Galilee in Mark chapter 1, 14 through 15, he was what? He was preaching what? Repent and believe. So we also saw Jesus' men, his disciples, last week calling men from their sin, repenting of their sin, and to believe their testimony as to who Jesus was. And in doing so, Jesus gave them miraculous gifts to validate that message. So it was this consistency between John's preaching, Jesus' preaching, and the apostles' preaching that caused some of the people to believe that Jesus was John the Baptist resurrected. But it also wasn't just their message. Also, the people had postulated that the reason that Jesus did these miraculous works was because it was impossible for any living man to do them. Therefore, it must be that Jesus was John the Baptist, resurrected from the dead. And instead of attributing those miraculous gifts to Christ himself, claiming and confirming his divine nature, they speculated that it must have come from John being raised from the dead, given supernatural power. It was the people who, instead of accepting Jesus' clear proof and validation as God, that they attempted to explain this reality away. But not all the people had settled on this assessment. Mark tells us, not only did they believe that he was John the Baptist, some believed that he was Elijah. Jewish people were keenly aware of those Old Testament passages from Malachi 4.5, Deuteronomy 8.15, that spoke of one who would come in the power and the spirit of Elijah to prepare the way for God's anointed one, his Messiah. Ironically, John the Baptist was the one 
that Jesus himself identified as the Elijah to come. But instead of heeding his explanation, the people speculated that since Jesus didn't usher in a physical kingdom, then he must not be that true Elijah to come. But the people also believed, thirdly, Jesus was at the very least some unique manifestation of an Old Testament prophet. They said what in Matthew 16, 14? He is a prophet like one of the prophets of old. But still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets, Matthew records. Luke records for us in his gospel that others said what? By others that one of the prophets of old had risen again. So the people had propagated that Jesus was at least a prophet, if not a resurrected prophet, like Jeremiah himself. It was this swirling propagation of who Jesus was that caused Herod to become fascinated with Jesus in a fickle manner. Luke recaptures this reality for us in his gospel when he says this, Now Herod the Tetrarch heard of all that was happening, and he was greatly perplexed. Because it was said by some that John had risen from the dead, and by some that Elijah had appeared, and by others that one of the prophets of old had risen again. And Herod said, I myself had John beheaded, but who is this man about I hear such things? And Luke adds that he was kept trying to see him. Herod says what? I killed John the Baptist the most righteous man in Israel. So who is this man, Jesus, that is preaching the same message that John preached, yet performing the acts commensurate with an Old Testament resurrected saint? Herod had become worked up about Jesus, paranoid about him, yet fascinated with him. But noticed, it was just that mere fascination. His interest in Jesus produced no true desire for salvation. Mark tells us that, Ke- that Herod kept trying to see him. As a tetriarch, Herod at any time had the authority and the power to summon an audience with Jesus at any time. But unlike those who crowded around him on the seashores, who filled the entire hillsides, and who pushed their way through crowds to touch Jesus, fascinated yet fickle, he was unmoved by Jesus, and he was unmoved by his message. We see this reality come to a head in Luke chapter 23, as Jesus is sent before Pilate by, Her- excuse me, by Pilate to Herod for judgment. Luke says this in Luke 23, 8 through 9. He says, Now Herod was very glad when he saw Jesus. For what reason? For he had wanted to see him for a long time. Why? Because he had been hearing about him and was hoping to see some sign performed by him. And he questioned him at some length, but he answered him nothing. It's upon Jesus being sent to Herod Herod, in this bloodied mess of humanity after his torture that Luke notes that Herod is literally giddy. He's exceedingly glad to see him. Finally, his desire to see this unique person he had heard so much about. And for what purpose? To see him do a sign. Jesus was not the one that Herod eagerly sought out for the way of eternal life. Jesus was no more than a sideshow to him. One who could do a few tricks and answer a few burning questions, but he was not one to be bowed down to as Lord. But notice here in our text that even as fickle as Herod was towards Jesus, even as he entertains the ideas of the people, and he even postulates exactly who himself to believe Jesus to be, that Mark records for us that Herod came under great conviction and fear. Verse 16, I want us to see secondly this morning, Herod's fear and conviction. Mark records for us, but when Herod heard of it, He kept saying, John, who I beheaded, has risen. 
It is as Herod hears of this holy man from Nazareth and then the possibilities of who he is that his own conscience begins to ravage him. It's not apparent here from the English translation, but the Greek language paints a clear and a vivid picture of Herod's torment. In the first part of the verse, Mark states, when Herod heard of it, the it here refers to those panoply of views who the people believe Jesus to be. The language indicates that this was an ongoing occurrence, meaning that he was continually running this through in his mind. That every time that Herod caught wind of some news about Jesus and his identity, it served as a constant and intense reminder as to what he had done to John. The very words of the people believing that Jesus could indeed be John the Baptist resurrected, it was like a lightning bolt that God used to convict the heart of Herod over and over again. And as that conviction was brought upon him, it produced a frantic result. Mark records for it. He kept saying, John, who I beheaded, has risen picture of Mark here records for us is one of a constant and a frantic response expressed by Herod as he heard the people's explanation of who they believed Jesus to be. As we will see in a minute, there were several factors and influences that led Herod to execute John, and yet through a constant and a clear confession, John made it clear that Herod was the one who indeed had beheaded him. While he did not raise the sword, as it were, he hardened his heart against the knowledge of who John was, and in doing so, he put an innocent man to death to save face. This was the conviction that was constantly and in weightiness that was brought upon him. And upon hearing of Jesus' teaching and his miracles, Herod was convinced through conviction that Jesus was John, come back from the grave to torment him. It's with this background then that Mark pauses from the account of our Lord's ministry and commissioning to provide his readers with the account of John the Baptist's death at the hands of Herod. And he does so, as we will learn, for a very specific purpose to demonstrate the nature and the motivations for persecution. It is in Mark's account of the arrest, imprisonment, and execution of John that we learn a considerable amount regarding the nature and motivation of the persecution of God's people. In verses 17 through 28, I want us to look at those nature and motivations, the first of which we see in verses 17 and 9 through 19, is that it seeks to suppress and rejects a call to repentance. Persecution seeks to suppress and reject a call to repentance. Verse 17, for Herod himself had sent and had John arrested and bound in prison. As you recall from the gospel accounts, the the message that John preached was not one of political revolution or the overthrowing of the Roman government or even Herod himself but rather John's preaching called for a greater spiritual reality. That men would repent of their sin in preparation for God's coming salvation in his Messiah. As the people would come out to John to be baptized, this would cause quite a stir in Jerusalem as it reached the ear of Herod. In fact, Matthew tells us that all of Jerusalem, Judea, as well as all of those who lived in the region of the Jordan were going out to John to be baptized. And so this movement from Herod's perspective could be seen as some kind of a potential uprising that needed to be squashed. In fact, Josephus, the first century historian, writing of John's imprisonment, states that he believed the real reason that Herod executed John was this. He said this, Herod who feared, lest the great influential John had over the people, might put into his power and inclination to raise a rebellion. For they seemed ready to do anything should John advise. Accordingly, John was a prisoner out of Herod's superstitious temper to Macherius, which is Herod's castle, and was put there to death. 
What Josephus is telling us here is he is recording from his own interpretation that the reason that Herod executed John was because he believed him to be an insurrectionist. And while Josephus records Herod's actions as being motivated by political reasons, Mark here records us his true motivation. You see, John wasn't gathering an army to overtake Herod's reign, but rather the reason for his imprisonment and his eventual execution was that he called Herod to repent of his gross sin and immorality. Mark goes on to say this on account of Herodias, the wife of his brother Philip, because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to put him to death and could not do so. Herodias here listed as the wife of Herod. She was the niece of Herod. And she was married to Herod's brother Philip. In addition, Herod already had a wife of his own, the daughter of the king of Eretus. So in taking Herodias as his wife, Herod divorced his wife, committed incest with his niece, and was guilty of adultery. It's out of this gross immorality that John's call of repentance made its way to Herod. How he did so, we can't be exactly sure, but the language of the text indicates that John was continually calling him to repentance. This may have occurred through several trips to the palace where John appealed to Herod. Or it's possible that in looking at the survey of John's ministry, that it was done through a series of public calls for Herod to repent of his sexual sin and immorality. Whatever the means was, John's call had not accomplished its intended purpose, but rather had only served to infuriate Herodias, Herod's wife who all wanted to do was to carry out her vengeance against him. But it was God who, as it were, interfered and kept him safe. Listen, this is what sin does to people. It deceives the heart. It hardens the hearts. And it enslaves people to their lust to the point That when their sin is called out and they are called to repentance, instead of recognizing their sin and turning in repentance to God, they will go to whatever lengths necessary to justify and to be able to carry out their sin in the manner by which they desire. This means that this sinful pursuit will run right through a person or persons who are calling them to repentance. In Herod's case, all he and Herodias wanted to do was to be left alone and to enjoy their life and their sexual sin and immorality. And yet there was John, constantly pleading, constantly calling them to forsake their sin. This is what Mark notes here for us, the reason that Herodias wanted to kill him. Those who are living in unrepentant sin are those who see this call to repent and to be reconciled to God, not as a grace and a mercy of our Lord, but rather as a barrier from preventing them to carry out the sin and the sinful desires that they want to do. The call of God's people to repent of their immorality and be reconciled to God is a call for those who are unwilling to do so, a message that must be snuffed out. This is the mouth that persecution attempts to silence. The mouth that declares both the holy and righteous standard that man falls short of, that man must meet. A standard that cannot be obtained through your own righteousness, but rather a righteousness obtained through the death and resurrection of Christ. One that in heeding the message to turn from our sin and to believe upon his finished work on our behalf, that can become ours in Christ. This is the message of God's people are to proclaim, and this was the reason that Herodias desired to kill John. But it's not only our call to repentance that brings persecution, it is also the lives of the righteous that is constantly confronting the lives of unbeliever. Secondly, verse 20, for Herod was afraid of John, 
knowing that he was a righteous and a holy man and he kept him safe. Mark indicates that initially, Herod had imprisoned John to protect him from the vindictive bloodthirstiness of his rage of his wife. And he did so because Herod recognized John to be what? A holy and a righteous man. That is that while he himself was not religious but suspicious, Herod recognized John to be one from God who had a relationship with God and how and he did not recognize that reality but he saw it in John's life. John wasn't merely a proclaimer of the truth, he was an obeyer of the truth. His life was not only witnessed by Herod, but all of those who knew him. His life was lived out in reverence towards God, in holiness of life, and in righteousness towards others. It's because of this that Matthew tells us that Herod was unwilling to put John to death because of the people's respect for this holy man. He said this in Matthew 14, 5. Although Herod wanted to put him to death, he feared the crowd because they regarded John as a prophet. It was John's life that was a constant rub, a constant reminder to Herod of his own sin and his shortcomings, his fallings before God. It was because of his own fear by the recognition of John's holy and righteous life as well as the fear of the people's revolt that God used at this point to stay the hand of Herod against John. For what purpose? So that John would continue to teach and to testify to Herod amidst his imprisonment. It was even as John was in prison there in Herod's palace that Mark indicates to us that Herod, either in bringing him into his presence or visiting him in his cell, that John continued to preach and teach the truth to Herod. It's during his imprisonment being kept alive by the sovereign hand of God through through Herod's fear of John that he constantly testified to Herod. And that is to say that because of the persecution that he faced, that in being imprisoned by Herod, John's ministry didn't stop. It just took on a different opportunity. He went from being an evangelist to working in prison ministry. His ministry there on the Jordan River and calling the people to repentance had been transitioned through his persecution to that jail ministry. One in which he was given the regular opportunity to testify directly to Herod. But it was in faithfully doing so that we learn a third great reality concerning the nature and motivation of persecution. And that is while curious to some aspects of the truth, it spurns the appeal to the conscience. While curious to the truth, it spurns its appeal to the conscience. Verse 20. And when he heard him, he was very perplexed, but he used to enjoy listening to him. Mark notes here that Herod was given many opportunities to hear John preach while he was imprisoned in his palace. And Mark says that he heard him. That means to hear someone audibly. It doesn't mean to comprehend its spiritual meaning. It is merely an external hearing. In simple terms, while Herod heard John's preaching, he had no true ears to hear his preaching and to comprehend that true spiritual message that he intended. As a result, Mark informs us that in hearing John teach, he says that Herod was what? Perplexed. The word means to be without resources, to be in dire straits, to be left wanting, to be in doubt, not knowing which way to turn. It was in the preaching of John that Herod was confronted with the truth that he taught, and while it intrigued him, he was left empty of its meaning and the proper response to it. It wasn't the spiritual truths that John preached that drew Herod to appreciate them and to contemplate them at a heart level, but rather it was his oratory skill, his passion his uniqueness, his command of speaking that was enjoyable for Herod to listen to. 
Listen, folks, this is a dark place to be. When one hears the truth of the word, and while being somewhat enlightened by it, and even somewhat attracted by it, that apart from faith and repentance, one cannot truly understand its true spiritual intent. And in doing so, their conscience is not led to the place of saving faith, but rather that conscience turns to spurn the truth. And as it spurns the truth, what happens? The heart hardens. And as the heart hardens, it it eventually turns on God's people in persecution. While it might excite the mind, it doesn't produce a conviction of sin in the soul. While being guilty to the conscience, it only serves to spurn the conscience's call to cry out in desperation. And in hearing its authority through its messenger, it rejects the message that he proclaims. Herod had been given ample testimony, ample opportunity. He had heard John's messages there in the wilderness of Judea. He had seen and testified to the holiness and righteousness of John's life. And he himself was testified to over a number of occasions to the truths of God's word by this imprisoned prophet. And yet Herod was the one who was actively yet superficially attracted to the truth. Tragically, while his conscience, as it were, was lit with some small flame of conviction, it was soon snuffed out and spurned by his unwillingness to turn from his sin. And in doing so, we see that when a conscience is spurned, when it snuffs out that small flame awakening man's guilt, then the desire to satisfy one's own lusts of the flesh motivates and it drives one's entire being. And they are willing to go to whatever links into the lowest depths necessary to satisfy its cravings. The fourth aspect of nature of motivation of persecution that we see in the passage this morning is the desire for the flesh trumps the sanctity of life. The desire of the flesh trumps the sanctity of life. Verse 21, a strategic day came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his lords and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. It would have been commonplace that upon a special occasion, such as a birthday or whatever it might be, that leaders and rulers would throw some extravagant banquet, inviting the various rulers and commanders and leaders under their command. This is the case here in this setting. But Mark here informs us that there is more going on here than just a celebration. It's a setup. He refers to it as a what? Strategic day. Meaning there is a plan in place that that takes advantage of this celebration as part of the scheme. Herod's wife, Herodias who had long since been brooding over John's indictment against him and and Herod's sinful relationship. And so she began to see an opportunity to incite the revenge that she so longed for. But she must do it secretly. She must do it stealthily, stealthily as to not raise awareness of her own desires to do away with John. So instead of her going, she uses her 15-year-old daughter to carry out her wishes. Verse 22, and when the daughter of Herodias herself came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his dinner guests. The type of banquets that Mark records for us here that they're carrying out would have mimicked the Roman version of them. They were banquets that were filled with feasting of drunkenness and sexual perversion. This gathering here is no different. Notice here, this is a male audience only. And as part of that evening, Herodias' own daughter comes and performs a dance that as Mark notes here was what? Pleasing to Herod and his guests. 
Look, we're not going to drudge through the depths of depravity here, but it is understood from that word that this dance elicited a sexual response from these men. And it is through that appeal to their flesh, to their depravity, and to their sexually perverse nature that Herod is willing to give up even the most valuable of riches. Look at verse 22. And the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you want, and I will give it to you. And he swore to her, Whatever you ask of me, I will give it to you. What? Up to half of my kingdom. Herod here is given over to his lust. He is given over to perversion. And in utter rashness, Herod offers up half of his alleged kingdom. Now listen. We had seen this man come under some level of conviction and guilt to the extent that he recognized that John lived a righteous life and even sought to protect him. And yet now we see what? No restraint, no sense of his sin, but he is what? Willing to promise and give away that which does not even belong to him. It is here that we see the enslaving nature of one's sinful lust and the irrational nature of sin. Herod, who was paranoid about losing his kingdom to Jesus, this holy man, now instantly, upon having his sexual lust excited, is willing to give this 15-year-old girl whatever she desires, even half of his kingdom. It's out of this rash declaration that Herod had fallen right into Herodias' trap. Verse 24. And she went out and said to her mother, What shall I ask for? And she said, The head of John the Baptist. Immediately she came in a hurry to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. It is here that Herod was most likely shocked Having made himself vulnerable through his sexual lust, he is now confronted with a dilemma. Would he have conviction? Would he continue to protect this holy man? Would he continue to listen to his teachings? Tragically, fifthly, this morning, we see the nature and motivation of persecution of God's people is driven by a fear of man over a fear of God. Look in verse 26. And although the king was very sorry, yet because of his oaths and because of his dinner guests, he was unwilling to refuse her. Immediately, the king sent an executioner and commanded him to bring back his head. And he went and had him beheaded in prison and brought his head on a platter. And he gave it to the girl and the girl gave it to the mother. It was in making this oath before his dinner guest that Herod was put in the most perplexing of states. Mark records for us that upon hearing the request of this 15-year-old girl, he says that he was what? Very sorry. The word in the Greek is peril upos. We get our word peril from it. Literally, it means to be grieved all over. It means to be intensely or exceedingly sad or devastatingly sorrowful. In fact, it's the same word that the gospel writers use to describe the grief our Lord experienced there in Gethsemane, awaiting his capture and execution. But listen, as yet, as sorrowful as Herod was, it produced no true repentance. No true conviction to recant his oath. No fear of God in putting this man to death. This is the false repentance, the one that is sad, that is sorrowful. It is the sorrow of the world that Paul speaks about in 2 Corinthians 7.10, that although exceedingly sorrowful, it is unmoved spiritually to true repentance. And notice here, in his sin, he doesn't hesitate this time to execute John. John. 
Mark uses his most familiar word that we have seen immediately. The picture here is that as soon as the words came off of her lips, while feeling some level of sorrow and remorse, Herod did not set an execution date, but rather immediately called for John's execution. It was in carrying out his execution that they brought back John's head to Herod. It was in this act that Herod did away with God's grace to him. The one who cared for him enough to call him to repentance, to point out his sin and immorality before God. Who had come to him a number of times pleading for him to turn from his sin. Who though imprisoned in his palace continually day after day, given the opportunity, testified to the truth before Herod. But now under the lust of his flesh and under the pressure of his own pride, he did just as he had confessed in verse 16 that what? I beheaded John. Jesus said this of John the Baptist in 11, Matthew 11, verse 11. He said, truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has not arisen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Jesus says, of all the men who have been born of women, that is, that the world has ever known, John is the greatest. As much as the Jewish people considered Elijah, Jeremiah, Isaiah, and even Moses, Jesus says, there has been no one greater than John. He was the one who was personally given the responsibility and privilege and duty to prepare the people's hearts for the coming Messiah. But with that privilege and duty came what? The same outcome as all the prophets of God had faced before, persecution and death. It was our Lord as he wept there coming into the city of Jerusalem in the triumphal entry that said what? Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who what? Kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. For as much as the people of God claimed to respect the prophets, Israel's history had shown their true spiritual colors towards them. That when confronted with God's truth through these men, through these prophets, they didn't receive them, but they killed them. John was in a real sense the last of those Old Testament prophets. The forerunner, the one who came in the power and spirit of Elijah to proclaim the coming of the Lord. It was this man, John, that Herod, as of one of God's own people, in attempting to silence him, put him to death. And in doing so, apart from our Lord himself, put to death the most holy man in Israel. And while this act haunted him, And while it even brought some level of guilt upon his conscience, Herod was unchanged by its conviction. He was unmoved spiritually by its reality. Instead of bringing this man to his knees, it only hardened him. The sin that led to John's death was held onto, it was petted, it was cultivated by Herod. And it was in the circumstances that were brought about that day that Herod expressed where his true heart's desire lie. Question is, though, is did Herod learn from his execution of John? Did he soften after that conviction came? The gospel writers tell us he didn't. Again, it was Herod's heart that in executing John that any sorrow he may have felt in those moments was gone as he meets the one that John was preparing the way for. That when Herod comes to behold the one that John served as the forerunner for, he is completely unmoved spiritually. As our Lord was brought to him in that mangled mess of humanity, humanity, 
on his way to atone for the sins of all of those who would believe upon him, Herod, upon feeling no conviction for his sin and no reverence for those whose presence he stood in, was merely giddy at his appearing and desired Christ merely to do some parlor tricks. The days of any torment of his conscience had passed. The voice of John calling him to repentance had faded. And in the hardness of his heart, killing the voice of God's grace to him, he had been handed over to judgment for his sin. You see, a guilty conscience isn't an assurance of salvation. There will be many that the church faces that you will face in this world who upon being confronted with the guilt of their sin, with the righteous life that we live, we will feel the guilt of their conscience testifying against them. And yet instead of that guilt driving them to full and true repentance, to be reconciled to God, they will turn in what? Hostility towards the messenger, and in doing so, as Herod did with John, seek to end their pleading. What we must learn from this passage is that this is the reality of being a disciple of our Lord. This is, that was the call to repentance was, excuse me, that with this call to repentance, with this call to believe in the gospel Surely enough, those two calls will bring with them persecution. This was the response to John's call to repentance. This was the response to our Lord's gospel. This was the response to the apostles' teaching. And it will be in some measure the response of every faithful believer who declares those same spiritual truths. Since this is the reality of the Christian life, what then is our response? Well, first of all, It is to understand the reality that Mark records for us. That those, as Paul tells Timothy, who seek to live a godly life will face persecution in this world. You see, what we see in John's life was that he understood his life wasn't about him. The whole of his life, his teaching, His ministry and his devotion and his life were in unison with a desire to be spent for Christ. Listen, if you are seeking to live a godly life, if you are seeking to share the truth with others, you don't need to go looking for a fight. It's going to find you. Secondly, this morning, we are not only to understand the reality that we will face persecution but it is also to understand what persecution produces in the life of the believer. And that is persecution affirms the reality that both our home and our hope are not in this world. Turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. Looked at it several weeks ago in our study together in 1 Peter, but 1 Peter 1 verse 6. He says this, In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by what? Various trials. These are trials that come upon them through suffering, through persecution. And then verse 7, for what purpose? So that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you you do not see him now but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. Peter says that as we face suffering, as we face the persecution that the world brings, it acts as a hallmark, as a spotlight to show the proof and genuineness of our faith. And in our faith being real, he says what? It is tested. It is then refined through those fires of affliction. And in doing so, God is using that flame to burn away the draws of this temporal life with its desires, and he is fitting us for where? Our eternal home. 
It's under that heavy hand of persecution that although we endure it physically, it is the spiritual means that God uses to wean us from this world and to fix our hope on our eternal glory. And in living in light of that reality, while enduring the persecution of this life, we are constantly being transformed into those who demonstrate to the world what? Where our hope truly lies. Why? Because that's where our Savior is at. Who in purchasing our sin sits now interceding for us. And who then will come as we were saying this morning as our what? Our blessed hope. It is this hope in our Lord that Mark concludes with a very small and maybe seemingly insignificant verse. He says this in verse 29 of Mark 6. When his disciples, meaning John's disciples, heard about this, they came and took away his body and they laid it in a tomb. While seemingly a tagline here on Mark's account, this last verse has much to say. Mark wants us to know that as tragic as the passing of this great prophet was, that when he died, he was certifiably dead and his body was laid in a tomb. He was not, as Herod feared and as others postulated, that Jesus was somehow John the Baptist resurrected. But in bringing John home to glory, God once again put the spotlight on who? Christ. It was in Christ and his ministry that the people beheld one who was far greater than John who was far superior to the greatest of the prophets. And listen, John wasn't mixed up about this. He understood it. Remember what he said? He must increase. I must what? Decrease. What was John saying? I know my part in this redemptive plan. I came to prepare the way for God's Messiah, calling men to repent because the kingdom of God is at hand. The salvation that God promised through the Old Testament prophets, one that must come through that highway of repentance, was brought forth in in the person and work of Christ. John made this truth clear in John 1, 29. It was John the Baptist that as he was baptizing there in the Jordan River, that upon seeing Jesus approach him said what? Behold, the Lamb of God who does what? Takes away the sins of the world. It was John, like all the faithful prophets before him, spoke of and pointed the people to who? The person of Christ. And in doing so, like the faithful prophets before him, suffered death at the hands of the Jewish people. But listen, John didn't suffer aimlessly. He just didn't suffer for suffering's sake. But rather in seeing himself as being privileged to carry that small flame of our Lord's truth for a time. His hope was not that of Herod's, who was in the applause and the recognition of men. But rather, John's hope was in the one who is to be man's truest hope. The Lord Jesus Christ, and with his hope settled on him, John was willing to face in full faithfulness and hope his own demise. Listen, we will see this man, John the Baptist, in glory. His soul, even now, is enjoying perfect joy, perfect fellowship with Christ himself. And guess what? When we see him there, you know what he's going to say? All the hardships, the imprisonment, and the execution were worth it all. Why? Because I decreased and he increased. Let's pray. Father, we can't help but read this account of a faithful saint, 
One who, as our own Lord Jesus attested to, was the greatest of all men. The greatest of the Old Testament saints, as, as much as Moses and Elijah, Isaiah, Jeremiah were all looked to, it was this man who was seen as the holy man of Israel. Father, we see that for those who seek to live a holy life, those who seek to obey our Lord, just as John did, will face persecution from those who even in some small way feel guilt and conviction for their sin, and yet apart from turning in faith and repentance, will then persecute those who speak against them. But it's also, Father, that we take great comfort in this passage not merely at the reality that we will face persecution in this life if we seek to live a godly life, but rather as John did, where his true hope lie. Father, we do pray that as we face persecution, whatever measure, Father, if that persecution comes to us and those who would slander our name, if it would come to those who would seek to meddle around, if it, Father, if it would even come as drastic as those who would seek to do us harm, Father, we would pray that we would count all things as loss, as Paul says, for the surpassing riches of knowing Christ Jesus, our Lord. Father, we thank you for this man. We thank you for your work in this man to set us an example. But Father, more than that, we appreciate and thank you and we look to the hope that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, for he is the one who John testified of and he is the one that we are to testify to. Thank you in Christ's name. Amen.